Hello everyone, it's me HawkeyeG and I'm back with another video for you. This time I'm giving some short and sweet campaign tips for Karaza Karak in Total War Warhammer 3's Immortal Empires campaign. The idea here is to hit some of the key points I've found useful in this campaign to help you better plan and prepare for your own campaign. This means that I'll be talking about any battle or campaign related tips that I think will come into play in most campaigns without spending too much time going through every single possible outcome of the campaign itself. Now just a quick note, uh, I've started playing on Legendary and very hard. Normally I'm a very hard and normal difficulty player, but uh, we're going to try Legendary this time. Unfortunately, since I can't do my usual thing of jumping in every 10 turns to show you something on Legendary, I am going to be showing you pieces from my normal difficulty campaign. And while I must admit I haven't finished my Legendary difficulty campaign yet, I would say that it's going just fine. So without further delay, let's get into the video. So my first tip is to wipe out Skarsnik immediately. In my experience, this is the best way to start out the campaign. Now, when you begin, you'd still have the Bloody Spears in these two settlements, as well as these two settlements, and Skarsnik will start at Mount Gunbad. You don't start at war with Skarsnik, and technically you have that grudge to take over the Black Crag, which is going to be occupied by Skaven, and you might be tempted to just go down here, take out Black Crag. I know that I am, just because that's what you would do in Warhammer 2. You want to try to you know, knock out Grimgore right away if you can. But in this campaign, I think it's better to push Snar Skarsnik early on. It seems to be a certainty that Skarsnik will attack you once he has his province secured. So you might think that you have time to take out this other province, but I don't really think you have time to do that. As soon as he's taken out the Bloody Spears, he'll turn on you. Instead, when Skarsnik goes to take the World's Edge Archway or the High Place, you'll actually have a good opportunity to then trap him in that settlement with a garrison and an army that's only at half health. You can eliminate that Arachnorok spider he has, you can take him out pretty easily, and you'll be able to move on and kind of capture this province, and I think that it's pretty easy to defend. Having secured Mount Gunbad, we can get that gold mine built, we can make some money from it, we can capture the rest of this province pretty easily, you know, the Bloody Spears might be able to take a settlement back from you, but that means nothing in the long run, and once we get these all captured, we can build them up, put some walls on it, eventually you'll probably get attacked by some greenskins from the east, you know, we can see the vampires are still here, but there's greenskins scaven out there, but if you got defenses, they'll, you should still survive pretty easily. And after you've secured this northeastern flank, you can focus yourself to the south where all of your major grudges are. Now my second tip is to try and move fast in the early game. My biggest issues in this campaign arose primarily when I would play it slow and steady in the beginning. If I didn't kind of rush down the Dead Rock Gap province, if you sack, you know, Skarsnik or the Bloody Spears a little bit, you're trying to scrounge up the money to upgrade your main settlement, right, and get that developed. I don't think that those are bad things on their own. The problem comes if it slows down your campaign progress too much. Since dwarfs have such slow growth and Immortal Empire seems to have similar slow rates in line with Mortal Empires, it means that if you're waiting for high tier troops, you'll be waiting for a while. Couple that with needing the economy to support those troops and you'll still have tough fights even if you tech up. Instead, it's better to just push out and try to take over these two or three provinces right away. Spamming out dwarf warriors and quarrelers will be more than enough to get you through the early stages of the game until you can kind of get some money, get a little bit of tech up, get some walls on things, and be able to better develop. As long as you can just hold steady for a brief period of time until you can get walls up, you can then get the income to carry you the rest of the way there. And over here in the east, you know, and in the north, minor factions don't really seem to be as likely to build a force strong enough to surpass your garrisons. So while you might see more war declarations in this campaign, you're not going to be threatened as much as you might feel like you are. The problem with not moving fast enough is it gives your enemies time to complete their fights and build up their forces a little, whether that's Skarsnik or even giving the Bloody Spears time to recover. So it doesn't matter if you have, you know, a good blend of dwarf warriors and quarrelers or maybe even long beards or you got some grudge throwers because the enemy is going to have a full stack and a half ready to go and you're going to take pretty decent losses fighting them. And the problem with that is when you weaken yourself too much in the early game of this campaign, since you've got enemies on all different sides of you, when they see that weakness, they're going to declare war on you. And then once they see that you're weak, once, once other factions see that you already have wars declared on you, even if somebody has a lower balance of power towards you, obviously it probably wasn't on this turn, but other factions will see that relative to the wars you have going on, 
you have a lower balance of power compared to your enemies, and the, the wars can just kind of pile up. So if you go too slow in the early game, you let your enemy build up, and you have to take these big fights, which result in big losses for you. Uh, it just it doesn't really seem to work out in your favor. And again, because it takes you a while to get some of your buildings to higher tiers, I don't think you really benefit as much from kind of sitting and camping it out. You can get pretty far with just dwarf warriors, maybe double back for quarrelers in the early game before really wiping out Skarsnik, but other than that, you don't really need the grudge throwers, you don't need any of that tech, and you don't want to de delay your early game. You'd rather kind of take out some of these enemies, take some territory, get some income, especially from some of these gold mines, and just try to hold down the fort with an army or two until you can get your walls built. Now before I move on, I want to say that if you're enjoying the video, do hit that like and subscribe to the channel. It always helps me out and lets me know what kinds of things you want to see. Of course, if you have any questions or think I missed anything, let me know in the comments. But I hope you're enjoying the video so far, and I hope that the additional tips will help you out in your campaigns as well. With that being said, we're moving on to tip number three, which is being careful how you handle the north. And I'd probably advise against confederating, especially Zufbar or Karakadrin. The main reason being that it's going to expose you to the vampire counts. And in this campaign in particular, they are already very strong and very big. Um, ultimately, they're probably n like Zufbar and Karakadrin are going to lose to Azhag and Vlad von Karstein. If you can, like maybe you want to help them out. I think if you're on a lower difficulty setting, you can probably manage the confederation where you take Zufbar and manage to just hold these territories and your southern territories. The, the key thing to remember is you're playing the dwarves and you're going to have grudges. So, oops. So you can't just hold down and defend your territories. You know, if, if Vlad comes in and raids you, now you have to go back and raid him. If an army comes in and attacks you, now you have to go back and attack them. You know, you're going to develop some additional grudges. You're going to create additional work for yourself to take on. I think that the best thing that you can do is just taking Dead Rock Pass here, holding down Mount Gunbat. If you can get some walls built here and focusing south, like I said, it, it, you're going to want... Uh, it's tempting to confederate north, but it's just going to create more problems than you need to have, and it's going to be a lot easier to just hold this one settlement instead of trying to navigate, balancing the north and the southern flanks, and progressing and defending all at the same time. Now tip number four is to watch out for the bloody hands. While I thought that this campaign would be a little bit easier since we finally saw Grimgore move out of Black Crag, and I thought that that meant, hey, you know, now we won't have to rush to us past, we won't have these two major factions that are immediately pressuring us, uh, I don't think that this is that much easier of a campaign even without him. Skarsnik is present, but you can take him out right away, it's easy to trap him like we talked about, but the problem really is the bloody hands. Uh, in my legendary campaign, on turn 14, they've already wiped out Barak Var and completely own both of these provinces. And the biggest problem is the Greenskins have access to the WOG mechanic. If the Bloody Hands get their hands on a WOG early on in the game, like, I can't, I, I mean, I have the money on normal difficulty right now, but I can't just magically double my fighting forces like the Greenskins can. And so they can be a very pervasive threat in the early game. You really want to monitor their progress. You want to be prepared for the inevitable battle against them. And again, you know, here I'm, here I was recruiting units into my army over this end turn. Um, but ideally, what I'd want to do now is use these extra funds to create a backup army to be able to plant here in Karaza Karak, try to bait the Bloody Hands into fighting me here or taking fights here, or at least be able to defend it while I work on cleaning up Black Crag and sweeping these southern territories. You essentially just, you gotta be careful, and it, it can play out so differently, right? 10, 20 turns ago in this campaign, we saw that Scabii had a bunch of this territory. It's really easy for the Bloody Hands to win one fight against them and confederate them. So it can, it can turn out for the worse in a pretty rapid manner. You just want to keep an eye on them. These really are going to be your biggest threat in the early game, so you kind of want to be preparing for that as early on as you can. Now for tip number five, we're jumping ahead a little bit here. We're maybe skipping an intermediate step, which is going to be Clan Moors, because as soon as you take out the Bloody Hands, dealing with Clan Moors is going to be your next step. But what I really want to talk about is the Southern Badlands, right? For many of you who know this as the new Thunderdome, there's a lot of different factions and dynamics to consider here. It's very likely you'll be exposed to several of them as you try to destroy Clan Moors in the mid game. 
Now, it can be pretty tough to determine how to manage diplomatic relations here. This depends on several factors, the most obvious being who is still alive. Uh, I tend to see the Tomb Kings end up thriving down here, and we can see they're not quite moving up to full strength at this time, but by the end of this campaign, they dominate this region. Thoric Ironbrow and Ironbrow's Expedition usually ends up performing pretty well here, and sometimes you'll get, you know, Teclas as the Order of Lore Masters, Krokgar of the Last Defenders to be alive. It seems I haven't discovered them here yet, but we know that they're down on these stretches, and, you know, Teclas and Krokgar would make for good allies for us. Thoric Ironbrow, somebody we probably want to confederate. The Tomb Kings are kind of a toss-up, right? They're one of the neutral factions, and so, you know, we can kind of decide to play that how you want, um, there's of course plenty of forces of destruction in the area, but I kind of assume that you're not looking to ally with them. Uh, but the thing is, you probably want to befriend Thoric Ironbrow and confederate him, right? The main problems with this are, he's likely going to war with Krokgar and Teclas later on. Those could be good trade partners and friends and would help fight against the forces of destruction. Uh, Thoric is also likely to go to war with Imric later, and I do find that Imric can also be a really valuable ally in this game because if he's doing well, he holds down this whole southeastern flank for you. It's really nice to have. And the Tomb Kings may also end up with war at Thoric at some point, and they're usually the most powerful enemy there, so it really depends on what you're looking for. The Confederation of Thoric is possible, can be difficult, he doesn't usually like you much as Karaza Karak, and if he's doing okay, he'll be hard to confederate. He's also likely to drag you into wars against people you'd otherwise befriend, but, you know, if you let him, if you hold your own ground and he starts losing ground in those wars, but you're still fighting his enemies, might be more likely to confederate. Another option here is allying with the Tomb Kings. I actually think this is the best option for an overall strong and safe campaign. Uh, they seem to be the main remaining threat down south. So having them as a friend takes a lot of pressure off of you, even if you are their main threat because of the way that Tomb Kings relations work. Since you're powerful, they're going to like you. So it's not too hard to work out some diplomacy with them, at least while you're sorting out other issues in the world. Um, otherwise, you could focus on trying to befriend Krokgar and Teclas. However, I think this is the least useful of the options, as they themselves are not very useful with their factions in this scenario, and you'll be able to find plenty of other good trade partners and allies in other places. So there's there's just some different factors to consider here. You know, when the forces of destruction are still around, all of these people might kind of remain friends, and it seems like things will be nice and easy, right? He's, he's friends with Last Defenders here. 30, 40 turns from now, he's going to be at war with them, and he's already at war with some of the tomb kings here too so it's just a it's you know it's kind of a friend of a friend sort of agreement for peace in the meantime but later on it goes to crap so just some things to keep in mind for once you play out into the future with that being said i do think i've covered everything i wanted to for this video uh, there's other things i have thoughts about such as how to navigate diplomacy with the empire in bretonia later on um, but the way that this campaign plays out can be pretty different from campaign to campaign so i don't really i think you kind of have to figure out how to navigate that on your own um, same thing with you know factions in the south it, it's tough to say and you know i didn't talk much about clan moors but i feel like that's kind of the obvious next step once you take out the bloody hands and it's more important to be prepared for the bloody hands than it is to be prepared for clan moors at least in my opinion just because it can really like you live or die in the first 30 turns based on how you handle the bloody hands walk you can survive past 30, 40, 50 turns, even if Clan Morris kind of catches you off guard, right? But I think that a lot of these starter tips will help people get off to a steady start in their campaigns and give them a good footing to fight from. There's a lot of different ways that Thoric Grimm's campaign can go early on, but I don't think that it changes the few things that you really should do pretty much every time at the start of the campaign. From there, it's about taking some small risks and trying to navigate diplomacy as best as you can. It's really about creating a stable northern zone of control and defensive flank and then focusing on pushing south to eliminate your greatest foes and wipe out your greatest grudges. I do hope that these tips help give you a better idea of what to look for and focus on in your own campaigns and that you learned a thing or two along the way. I'm definitely still enjoying Mortal Empire so far and I've had a lot of fun playing as the dwarves. I think they're still in a great place and you should look forward to more videos from me on them in the future. In the meantime, if you did enjoy the video, please drop a like and click subscribe so you can stay updated. And if you have any tips of your own or any questions about anything I said, just leave them in the comment section below. As always, thanks for watching, have a great day, and we'll see you on the next one.